Yeah, give it up for our summer interns. Some of you may or may not know this, but every summer we have a summer internship with incoming juniors and seniors. Uh, this year we had 11 summer interns, and uh, we just wanted to, this morning, graduate them. Uh, this summer they served 100 plus hours in serving this church and serving this community. So that is an awesome, awesome feat. So we've got three pillars to our Zoe Summer Internship. Uh, the first is service, the second is discipleship, and the third is leadership training. And we've been doing different service projects throughout uh, the community as well as within the church, helping out with VBS and old Shawnee days. And many of you probably saw them, actually you didn't see them, you saw what they were doing here in the Sunday morning service. They were helping out in the back and greeting uh, doing a bunch of stuff like that. We also have a discipleship track in which we're uh, talking about real issues, talking about what's going on in their heart, as well as teaching. Uh, every Wednesday, they spent time with a different pastor on staff here. By the end of the summer, they got a teaching, uh, a two-hour teaching from each of our pastors. So they really had to bear down for two hours on a Wednesday afternoon, and then listen to me Wednesday night as well. So, uh, and then also we do leadership training, and so we've been giving them different opportunities all throughout this church to lead in various ways as well as lead in our youth ministry. I am so passionate about seeing young people realizing their potential and stepping on that leadership, and I can say that every single one of these individuals, they have different strengths, different skill sets, different personalities, but God wants to use them in their own unique way, and I saw them step out in that this summer. And so I'm so excited, so proud of each and every one of them. We're going to pray for them as a church as their send-off of graduation. We're going to send them into their schools. We're going to send them into the community uh, to be leaders for Christ. Amen? Amen. Well, Lord God, we thank you for every single one of these summer interns here. Thank you for their service to this church, to this community, their service to you, their desire to grow in you. And God, we make a bold proclamation over them. Would they be leaders for you? We send them out into their schools, wherever that is. We send them to the lonely and the broken. Would they be your hands and feet? Would they see people with your eyes the way that you see them, Jesus? Would they realize that it's not about big personalities to be leaders for you? You call those that, that come from different places with different backgrounds to lead for you. And so, God, we pray that over them. We send them out. In your name we pray. Amen. Everybody give it up for a 2015 summer internship class. You guys can go ahead and go receive your certificate of completion. And everybody else, would you please do me a, a favor and welcome up our lead pastor, Pastor David Jones. All right. I am so excited about our internship program. This year has been phenomenal. Uh, the teens that have been serving this church. I, I mean, I, I want you to kind of understand this, and I want to personally thank all of the interns this morning. Uh, they've served in children's ministry. They served in the tech team. Uh, they served in the coffee shop, ushers, greeters. I mean, every place in this church that we have an opportunity uh, for them to get involved, they got involved and really brought a lot of life to our staff. And uh, so thank you guys so much uh, for your labor of love. We really love you guys. And for those of you uh, that are teenagers out there, and uh, next year you uh, have the opportunity to do the internship program, and we'd love to have you, because we love young people at this church. We have a heart for young people. We want to raise up young people and uh, thrust them forth in the leadership that God has for them. How many of you love young people, young kids, right? We're passionate about them. We want to train them, praise God. Uh, we are in the middle of a series called Kingdom Come. Everybody say, Kingdom Come. Okay, can we do better than that? All right, everybody say, kingdom come. Kingdom come. kingdom come, that's right. And last week, we I'm gonna give you a little bit of a recap. Last week, we talked about uh, the two kingdoms 
that are here on planet Earth, so to speak, that are vying for the attention of the souls of mankind. There's a kingdom of darkness and there's a kingdom of light. There's a kingdom of Satan and there's a kingdom of God. And I said this last week and I'm gonna say it again. Yes, we're that kind of church. We really believe in the scripture 100% that there is a demonic kingdom, but there's also an angelic, wonderful God kingdom whom Jesus is the king. This is what we believe as a church, that there's the kingdom of the world and there's the kingdom of heaven. And these two are in opposition to one another. And it's important for all of us to understand that there is an opposition between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. But what we must recognize is simply this, that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is an ever-expanding kingdom, and the kingdom of darkness cannot overwhelm the kingdom of light. Jesus is headed towards all authority and all power and all rule here on planet Earth and in the kingdom of heaven, and this is what we have to look forward to, that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And one day, every knee will bow. And every tongue confess. And this is where we're headed towards in history is that one day every knee and every tongue will proclaim that Jesus Christ is the King of Kings. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Now, we also said this, that each kingdom operates just a little bit differently. They operate by different rules. The kingdom of heaven says that the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And the kingdom of the, of the world operates very differently. They say, climb your way to the top, and it doesn't matter who you hurt along the way. And Jesus says, no, it's the first that shall be last. It's the kingdom of the world that seeks after greatness and fame and it's the kingdom of heaven that says, forgive those who hurt you and persecute you. And it's the kingdom of the world that says, don't let anyone get away with anything. And you keep those grudges and don't let them forget how they hurt you. The kingdom of heaven says, love your enemies. And the kingdom of the world says, hate your enemies. There are principles that govern each of these kingdoms. And the kingdom of darkness produces death and despair and destruction. And the kingdom of light produces love and joy and peace. We could say it this way, the kingdom of heaven produces life. And last week, I tried to create this idea and instill this within each one of us, that it's one thing to learn about the kingdom of God, it's one thing to talk about it, and it's another thing altogether to experience it. And Jesus talked to the disciples about the kingdom of God more than anything else while he was here on earth. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, that was the first and foremost of his message. But he took his disciples on a field trip all the time, making sure that they weren't just talking about it, but they were experiencing the kingdom of God. And for each one of you, I want you to experience the kingdom of God in your own life. That you experience his power and his purpose and the passion that he has for you every single day. This is what God has for you. So we don't just talk about it, we live it. As Christians, we live in the kingdom of God. And today we're going to be talking about kingdom come. Last week we talked about kingdom come in us or in me. And today we're going to be talking about kingdom come in the church. What does it mean for the kingdom to come at Cross Points Church? What does it mean for God's kingdom to be operating here at Cross Points Church, many of us are familiar with the Lord's Prayer. And I want to make sure that we take just a little bit of time to talk about this this morning. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and his disciples come to him and they say, Teach us how to pray. And Jesus says, Pray like this Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. And then verse 10, 
may your kingdom come soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And I want to take these two uh, thoughts and kind of tear them apart just a little bit. May your kingdom come. May your kingdom come. When Jesus is asking the disciples to pray like this, he's saying, I want you to pray that God's authority, that his reign, that his rule would come in your life and in this world and invade every space of every part of planet Earth. This is what God has. He wants his rule, his kingdom, his reign to come. It starts with you, with bended knee to say, Jesus, I recognize you as the king in the kingdom. It starts with you. And then as we begin to embrace Jesus as the king and we say, may your kingdom come, well, he's come in our lives, and now together collectively we're saying, Jesus, may your kingdom come here as a collective body of people gathered together to worship and recognize and understand the King of Kings. And when we together as the body of Christ come together with that perspective to say, Jesus, your kingdom come, something powerful begins to happen. Heaven invades earth. Heaven invades your life. Heaven invades us and invades our space. And that's where it gets really exciting. So we pray, Jesus, may your kingdom come. May it come here at Cross Points Church. But this is a broad prayer to pray, your kingdom come. What does that mean? What does that look like? It means that the culture of the kingdom is operating in the culture of this church. I want you to think about that just for a second. The culture of heaven, the culture of the kingdom of God operates very differently than the culture of the world. And when we say your kingdom come, your culture come, your authority come, your rule come, your reign come, may it be instilled in us here at Cross Point Church. In other words, we want his will to be accomplished. We want his purposes to be fulfilled. We would say it this way, that God, your ways are higher than our ways, that your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. I would say this, that God's plans are better than my plans any time of the day. Would you agree with that? God's plans are so much better than your plans. You have a particular plan about how things should go in your life or the destiny that you might have in your life, but let me tell you this, God's plans are so much better than your plans. He'll do something so much far exceedingly above and beyond what you can ever think or imagine in your life. If you bow your knee to the king and say, God, may your kingdom come. And it's the same in this church. Collectively as a church, as we come together and we say, Jesus, may your kingdom come. May you have your plans and your purposes. Well, then God begins to do something extraordinary in the church. He provides all kinds of opportunities for us to enable his kingdom to come. And so I have three things today that I'm praying for and that I see at Cross Points Church as we look about the kingdom coming in this place. And the three things are simply this, that when the kingdom comes in the church, it looks like, one, a church of faith. When the kingdom of God comes, it looks like a church filled with koinonia. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then finally, when the kingdom of God comes, it looks like a church that's set apart. So we're going to talk about faith this morning. The Bible puts it this way in Hebrews 11, verse 1. It says this, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. I want to read this one more time. Faith is the assurance of things what? Hope for. And the convictions of things? Okay. 
So the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. In other words, as a church, when we talk about Jesus, your kingdom come, we see things that other people don't see. We hope for things that other people can't even begin to hope for. I want to say that again. As a church, we come together and we have the assurance of things hoped for. We hope for things that other people can't begin to hope for. And we see things that other people can't even begin to see. That's what faith is. You see, we are a church that expects the unexpected. You're a church that expects the unexpected because we see things that other people can't see. Now, let's keep reading this verse. Now, verse number six, it says, without faith, it's impossible to what? Without what? Without faith, it's what? Impossible to please who? Please. So, If you don't have faith, you can't please God. So if you can't see things that other people can't see or hope for things that other people can't hope for, you're not, in a sense, pleasing God. Because he says this, whoever would draw near to God must what? Must believe that he what? And that he... Those who, okay, so there's a lot wrapped up in these verses. As a church of faith, we believe for the unexpected. We hope for the unexpected. We see things that other people can't see because we come before God, who's the king of the universe and the king of this church and the king of our lives, and he has all power, all authority, all rule. That means we believe the unexpected in our lives. As a church, um, last year, I had some of our leadership begin praying. I felt God had put on my heart that we were to receive property for our facility. And it seemed a little bit crazy to some people because we already have lots of acreage. We have 30-some acres on this property, but God dropped on my heart that, man, we need to begin praying for more property for future expansion. And so we began to pray, and there's property right to the west of us that's for sale, and they wanted, you know, $400,000 for this piece of property that was 12 acres. So I said, well, let's go and pray. Let's expect the unexpected. Let's, let's see what other people can't see. We can't afford $400,000, but let's go ahead and expect the unexpected. So I took some of our leadership and we began to do prayer walks and we prayed over the property and we lifted our hands and we approached the king in his kingdom because you see, he owns everything. Doesn't he? He owns everything. If he wants to give us something, he can give it to us. And we prayed and we asked God and we went back to them and we said, hey, we can't afford it. Would you mind, like, want to give it to us? And he said, well, no, we can't give it to you, but they dropped the price which was great, but we still couldn't afford it. And so we just kind of let it go. Well, then a couple of months goes by, and a guy shows up in our office, and he says, hey, I have property to the south of you. It's 20 acres, and I purchased this property in the early 60s, and all I want to do is get out of it what I put into it, and it's 20 acres. And we said, well, oh, okay, well, that's great. How much do you want for it? And he says, well, all I have to have is $100,000. To which we said, okay, well, let's, we'll take a look and pray over it and whatever. Well, we did an appraisal on the property and it's worth one to two million dollars. So we said, we'll buy it for (laughs) $100,000. So here's the thing. We were praying, we were believing for the unexpected And we were praying for 12 acres, and God gave us 20 acres. He did something that was extraordinary. He did something beyond what anybody else could see. And now I signed the paperwork at the end of December of last year, so just a few months ago. And now we own 20 acres to the south of us. 
And that's God moving through me in the sense of kind of telling me kind of what he wants to do here at this church, that collectively we come together, we pray, we seek God's face, and God moves and releases property. But you see, this is what God wants to do in every single one of your lives. He wants you to believe the unexpected, to see things where other people don't see things. Even when things don't make sense, even when people say, that's impossible, it can't be done. And you say, I serve the king. I serve the king of kings and the Lord of lords, and we operate by a different set of rules where the impossible becomes the possible, where the unexpected becomes expected. Can I get an amen for that? This is how God wants you to live in your life, that you begin to pray and seek his face and have open hands and say, God, you do what you want to do, but I want to have greater faith because I know that if I diligently seek after, me, after you, that you're going to reward me. Isn't that what we just read? But faith, faith sees things where other people doesn't see things. But God makes it clear without faith, it's impossible to please him. And whoever draws near to him must believe that he exists and that God is a rewarder of those who seek him. This is what God has for your life. I want to ask you a question this morning. If on a scale of 1 to 10, how are you operating in your life when it comes to faith? Just this past week, if you could kind of quantify it, how much am I stepping into this realm of kind of the unknown, of the things that I can't see? On a scale of 1 to 10, one pastor kind of put it this way. He says, now think about it. One is a guy who maybe is out on the gutter and is so far from God. So none of you are ones. You're in church. It's good, right? You're here. And none of you probably are operating as a 10 because that's Jesus himself. But maybe somewhere in between, between 1 and 10, you're operating on some kind of level of faith. I want to challenge you this week that you take one step further in your journey to faith. That you begin to believe for the unexpected. To believe for those things that you can't see. To hope for those things. Beyond hope, trusting in the king. Would you do that this week? Would, be a, would we be a church of faith? So when the kingdom of God comes in the church, it looks like faith. And when the kingdom of God comes in the church, it looks like a church of koinonia. Can everyone say koinonia? It's simply a Greek word. It's transliterated. It, it means simply this, a joint participation, the share which one has in anything, participation. You could also put it this way. It's kind of an old term word, but fellowship. But it's deeper than just getting together and having fellowship with one another and eating uh, food together and just kind of connecting with one another. It goes way deeper than that. The, the apostles and the believers were gathering together in the first century church. And in Acts 2.42, this is the verse that we find this word. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. That's that word, koinonia. And to fellowship. In other words, they were part of something bigger than just themselves. They were part of the church. They were part of something that God was doing in their world. And they were sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. There's this idea of fellowship. It's a, a mutual gathering together for a common purpose and a common cause. That's what the church is. I think about the movie The Fellowship of the Ring. How many of you have ever seen the fellow? Let me see your hands out there. The Fellowship of the Ring. Okay, a lot of you guys have seen that. Uh, the Fellowship of the Ring came out in 2001, but it was a book that was written in the 50s by Tolkien. And, and um, it's about this meek little hobbit of the Shire uh, and eight of his companions. They set out on a journey to Mount Doom to destroy one ring and the dark lord Sauron. And there's some huge biblical overtones in this book and also in the movie if you get a chance to see it. But they come together 
in a fellowship, in a group. There's nine of them, and they all come together, and every single one of them have powerful gifts, uh, strength and power and, and all of these different things. But this meek little hobbit who has no power and no authority and just kind of a, a nobody out in the middle of the shire, just this little guy, he is the leader of the fellowship of the ring. And I love the thought and the perspective of this book and specifically the movie. And that is simply this, that we are like that little hobbit Frodo. Most of us have probably very little gifts, not much power. We wouldn't say that we're that extreme or that we're that gifted or whatever. We're just little meek. But God takes the meek things of the world to confound those who are strong. And God wants to take you in your life and bring you together in a fellowship of the church so that we go out and conquer Mount Doom. He wants us to come together as a church and that we're going to bring the kingdom of God, the kingdom of lightness, and we're going to be in opposition to the gates of hell. It says that the church... The church will come and conquer the gates of hell. In other words, the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against the church that's in a mode that says that we're going out to affect the kingdom of darkness. We're going to snatch people from the kingdom of darkness and bring them into the kingdom of light by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you, as just a simple, meek Little person, whoever you are and whoever I am, God uses the meek things of the world to confound the wise and the strong. So I never want you to discount who you are. Don't discount who you are. God wants to use you to change the community around you. Don't look down on yourself. Don't just think, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a preacher, I'm not a missionary, I'm not an intern. I don't really have much involvement in the church, and I really can't say a whole lot, and I can't do anything. That's the enemy whispering in your ear saying, you're a nobody. But God, he whispers in your ears, and he says, you're my child. I see you as a lion. I see you as filled with my spirit. You're like a David taken on Goliath. And when my power comes upon you, nothing can stand in your way. This is what God has for every single one of you. Not just for a pastor or a preacher or a missionary. He has that for you. And as a fellowship, we come together and we begin to invade the dark places of this world. That's what koinonia is all about. It's fellowship. It's the fellowship. 1 Corinthians 1.9 is a really fascinating uh, verse. It says this, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. We're called into fellowship with Jesus Christ. So not only collectively are we called in a fellowship, but we're called into koinonia with Jesus Christ himself. In other words, he asked us to participate with him in this mission of seeing dark places become light, of seeing people who are hurt and broken and lost and discouraged and seeing them plucked out of that kingdom of darkness and pulled into the kingdom of light. This is the fellowship that we have with Jesus Christ himself. This is what koinonia is all about. It identifies the idealized state of fellowship and unity and cooperation that exists within the church of Jesus Christ. And he gives us that power. This is what the church looks like. That we have friendship, meaningful, deep relationships as we come together. Fellowship one with another. Not just with a mission out there, but a mission internally that God wants to do deep things in your life. As a church, I was thinking about the difference between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light when it comes to fellowship and koinonia. And I was reading this fascinating article about the hookup culture 
in uh, of campuses all across the country. For some of you may or may not be familiar with this hookup culture, but it's one that accepts and encourages casual sexual encounters, including one-night stands and other related activity, which focus on physical pleasure without necessarily including emotional bonding or long, long-term commitment. And a lot of these young people are just connecting with each other, some people just for the very first time, having a sexual encounter, and they're just kind of moving on. There's no deep and lasting relationship at all. It's just because it feels good to me and because I just want to do it. I'm thinking about the long-term consequences of that kind of behavior, where there's no meaningful relationship, there's no real connection or bond. That we just do it because it feels good. You see, the kingdom of darkness would say, you know what, if it feels good, just do it. It's okay. You're not hurting anyone or anything. But internally, there's challenges as a result of this hookup culture. And I read this uh, psychologically, psychological review study that said this, that college students who recently engaged in this hookup culture reported lower levels of self-esteem. Lower levels of life satisfaction. Lower levels of happiness. Students who recently engaged in hookups had higher distress scores. Indicated by levels of depression and anxiety. So see what happens is is it's a feel good thought. It's a feel good action. But it's end is destruction and death. And the kingdom of light, on the other hand, says that God wants us to have meaningful relationships that go deep. That sex is reserved for the marriage context. Not just outside of marriage. No, sex is reserved for marriage. Why? Because that is the ultimate relationship connection that one can have. And as you begin to put down roots and grow with someone, you have deep meaningful relationships that will last a lifetime. And you'll derive much more happiness and peace and pleasure and purpose together as you stay within the confines of marriage. But see, the kingdom of the world says, no, if it feels good, just do it. And we could take that in all kinds of different areas. If it feels good, do it. Don't worry, it's not a big deal. But no, see, that's the lie of the kingdom of darkness. And Jesus says, no, I want you to have life and life to the full. I want you to have meaningful relationships. I was thinking about meaningful relationships here at this church. We've been around as a church for almost 50 years. Next year, we celebrate our 50th anniversary. Wow. That's, that's, I'm pretty excited about that. And there are a few people here in this church If they've been in small group, they've been in fellowship, they've been in koinonia for 30 years. Can you imagine being in the same small group with the same for 30 years? You think you get to know someone really well if you're connected with them for 30 years? That someone is going to pray for you, encourage you, help you through the dark times in life, rejoice with you on the mountaintops of life. You see, this is the deep, meaningful relationship that God has for us. Not just some hookup culture, but something that lasts and lasts for a lifetime. That God wants you to be engaged in relationships that are meaningful for you. Because I guarantee you, at some point in your life, you're going to go through the valley, and you're going to need someone to be there with you. You're going to need koinonia. You're going to need fellowship. You're going to need somebody that's going to pray for you and encourage you and help you. And on the other hand, you can be the source of joy and peace and prayer for someone else that's going through the valley. And I want to encourage us as a church, we're going to be launching small groups in a greater capacity in our church in January to begin praying about your involvement in a small group. If you're not in a small group, man, it is so vitally important that you develop relationships with people. I was thinking about Heather and I, and we struggled to have kids for 10 years. And we had times when we were doing fine and other times when we were extremely depressed and discouraged and wondering where God was. We had people in our lives that prayed for us and cared for us and talked to us. You're going to go through hard times. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. 
And if you're not engaged in koinonia, if you're not engaged in a relationship with someone, it will hurt you and harm you and potentially drive you away from the faith. We need each other. It's the way God designed it, that we would have fellowship with each other. Please, I urge you as a pastor, don't isolate yourself. Don't just come and sit in a chair. Come and get part of a fellowship group, that koinonia, that you have purpose uh, together with a group. Some of you I know are already involved in groups and you're connected in and uh, working in the coffee shop or on the worship team or tech team or whatever. We have lots of places for you to get involved. But it's more than just getting involved and serving for a purpose. I was here on Thursday night with our tech team and with our worship team. And, I mean, I love these teams as they come together. They pray for each other and encourage each other. They're laying hands on each other. We're praying for healing that God would move in their lives. It's not just coming and serving a purpose. You're not just a cog in a wheel. We want to see God's kingdom purposes fulfilled in your life. And that's what koinonia is all about. So when we pray kingdom come in the church, it looks like faith. It looks like koinonia, and finally, it looks like a church that is set apart. In 1 Peter 2, Peter writes, and he says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a what? Well, let's try that one more time. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a... You're a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of what? And into his wonderful light. You see, these kingdoms here in America, I'm going to get off on a rabbit trail just for a second. The kingdoms in America, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, they're pulling farther and farther apart. They really are. They're pulling apart. And And you know what? As they're pulling apart... There's a distinction between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's a real distinction. If we were to go back maybe 40 years ago or 30 years ago, yes, even 50 years ago, and we were to look at America as a culture, it would be hard to distinguish, I think, between the culture of America and the culture of the kingdom of light. But as we've progressed over the years and the kingdom culture has kind of dislodged itself from America and now you see there's a kingdom of darkness and a kingdom of light in real stark contrast and some people get really worried about it and concerned about it and overwhelmed about it. But as a pastor, I rejoice. It's better because I would much rather have those in the world recognize the difference between darkness and light. I would much rather talk to somebody who says, yeah, I'm not a Christian, and admit that, than someone who says, yeah, I'm a Christian, my mom is a Christian, my grandma was a Christian, sure, I'm a Christian. It's much more difficult to talk to someone who thinks they're a Christian when they're really not than someone who knows they're not a Christian and is open to it. And so I get excited in the potential of what's going to be happening in the next five, ten years here in our culture and in our county because I believe it's ripe for the harvest. I believe the kingdom of darkness has discouraged people and led people on a path of destruction and they're in despair and, and they're looking for something more meaningful. They're looking for faith and they're looking for koinonia and they're looking for something that's set apart that's different. And this is what the kingdom of God has to offer. We are set apart. And there are two kinds of Christians in this kingdom and, and I want to maybe land here a little bit this morning, and that is that one kind of Christian tries to blend in with the world. And I want to challenge you, don't be that kind of a Christian. Don't try to just blend in with the world, and you're at work, and they're talking dirty jokes, or they're talking about their sexual escapades, and you just kind of join right in. Don't do that. You're putting a bad name on Jesus Christ. You're not representing the king and his kingdom. And then there are others The other kind of a Christian is able to talk and communicate with those in the world, but they're also set apart. And it's a really tricky line because Jesus was a friend of sinners. 
He didn't extricate himself from the world. He didn't remove himself from, a, from the world and go up onto a hill and just try to live, you know, all isolated by himself. No, Jesus was in the world, but he wasn't of the world. And this is what he calls each one of us to be, that we're in the world, but we're not of the world, that we can talk to the world and laugh with the world and have fun, but there's also a line here that says, no, I'm set apart, I'm different, I'm holy, because God has made me holy. You know, Jesus, he had this perfect example of mercy and grace, of mercy and truth. He was the one that would say, repent. He would say, sin no more but he also turned water into wine he also said come you're gonna i'm gonna come to your house today you see that you see both sides of the coin he invited people into his world and he loved with them and laughed with them he encouraged them and played with the kids but he also said go and sin no more come follow me come take up your cross and walk with me there's this fine balance and you're gonna find yourself at work You're going to find yourself at school in the weeks to come. And people are going to be talking and chatting. And they're going to be saying stuff that probably is going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. And that's okay. Because you're different. You're a believer in Jesus. You should feel a little bit funny when they're talking about all of those things. But it doesn't mean that you step out of that world and say, well, I'm not going to associate with those people because, oh my goodness, they're just too much for me. That's not what Jesus calls us to do. He calls us to be set apart, but deeply engaged in the world. You're called to be set apart, but you're called to be engaged in the world, to talk with, to encourage, to pray for, to ask God to open up the window of opportunity to speak truth into their life. You see, you can be fully filled with grace and love and encourage, do good things and kind deeds towards, and at the right time, wants to take you from despair, that all of these things that you're engaged with, they're headed down a path that are not going to satisfy. And God will use you, like little Frodo, to destroy Mount Doom. You see, people are filled with Mount Dooms in their life, and God wants to use you to destroy Mount Doom by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you're just this little meek nobody. But as you speak forth, as you take a little bit of steps to say, Jesus loves you, he cares for you, you'll see that God will begin to work through you, and you'll conquer Mount Doom, and we'll see people snatched out of the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of light. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? I want to first pray for those who are believers and Christians here that have already committed lives to Christ. And then I'm going to offer an invitation for those of you that have never received Christ. You've been operating in the kingdom of darkness and God wants to move you into the kingdom of light of his son. He wants to give you purpose and meaning. And I'm going to give you an opportunity in just a little bit, just to raise your hand. And as you do that, you're going to signify that you're placing your trust in Jesus. You're going to be transferred from one kingdom to another. And it happens in an instant. I'm going to give you that opportunity. I'm not going to call you forward. I'm just going to pray for you right where you are. And then we can talk after the service. But for those of you that are believers, I want to challenge you with this thought. Where are you on a scale of 1 to 10 when it comes to faith, or when it comes to koinonia, or when it comes to being set apart? Where do you find yourself? And this week, could you move one step further? I want to pray for you. If you want to move one step forward in one of those areas, just lift your hand because I want to pray for you today. God, you see these hands that are lifted high? Every single one of us, God, we want to move closer to you. I pray that you would infuse those who have their hands lifted up with your power and your spirit and your strength. God, to think more deeply when it comes to understanding who you are, that we would have greater levels of faith. God, that we would be those that are connected and committed to one another and pointing the end a common purpose. And God, we'd be those who are set apart. Jesus, I ask, help us to think deeply about that this week and then to take action, to not just talk about it, but Lord, to go on a field trip with you on each of these areas. Lord, I pray, fill this congregation with your faith. Fill this congregation with greater koinonia. Lord, fill this congregation, Lord, that we would be more holy in your sight, Jesus. Thank you, Lord.
Lord, as you're going to do that in the lives of those who have their hands up today. In the name of Jesus. You can put your hands down now. There may be some of you here that came today and you don't know why you found yourself here. Somebody dragged you here. But man, the message is speaking to you and you're recognizing, I need more faith. And Jesus wants to take you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and fill you with purpose. And if that's you, I want you simply right now just to raise your hand and I'm going to pray for you. You're going to pray. God's going to, I see that hand right there. Anybody else that would say yes? See that hand right there. Anybody else that would say, yeah, that's me. I need to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Maybe you've been backslidden and you really haven't been walking with God and that's you and you want to say, yeah, I want to recommit to Christ today. I feel like somebody needs to do that here today. If that's you, just lift up your hand and say, yeah, that's me. I've kind of fallen away. But man, I want to get my life right with God. I see that hand right over there. Anybody else? I just feel like maybe there's one other person right there. Thank you. I see that. Amen. Just keep your hands lifted high. I want to pray with you today. You just respond uh, right after me, and you're going to make this prayer your own. We're going to invite Christ to come into our lives. Just repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I believe in you. The whole church. Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross and that you rose again to give me new life. I place my faith in you. I repent from my sins. I turn to you. Transfer me from the kingdom of darkness to light. Thank you for coming and residing in my life. Amen. Let's give everyone a great big hand that did that. God bless you and you and over there. God bless you as well. Would you stand this morning? Let's stand this morning. Uh, We want to pray for you. If you have any need for prayer whatsoever, we'd love to pray for you. A physical healing or situation that you're going through. Don't forget in the back, we also have some information about the school and adopting schools. We'd love to have you check that out as well. Uh, Man, uh, if you uh, lifted your hand, I would love to talk with you after the service and uh, give you some pointers and some tips in terms of walking with Jesus and what that looks like. Uh, Otherwise, feel free to come forward. Uh, As is our tradition here at the church, uh, I want to bless you, and uh, we receive that blessing by just raising our hands. So raise your hand this morning. Let me bless you. God, I pray that you would fill each one here with greater faith and greater koinonia, and that you would set them apart, that they would love you and walk with you all the days of their life, May they go forth filled with the strength of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. And everybody that wants that says amen. Amen. God bless you.